Hello, and welcome to the Our Foundations podcast. My name is Joshua, your host, as we get into the third and final section of the Julianne Romanello interview. Part two left off with Julianne talking about trust in institutions and how a lot of things get passed along to the public as being true and often they are perceived as true and sometimes perceived as even being the public's own idea. I believe at least that that's probably an allusion to the Delphi method or something similar. And she mentioned at the end of that that especially if something is blockchain based. And that was the keyword that gets us into the rest of this interview. And I will go ahead and just play that. And this will be the rest of the interview with Julianne Romanello. They're telling me that it's my idea, but is it really? And we have to be able to say, no, it wasn't. So this is a lie. It's against reason and and we should be questioning. <laughs> Yeah, but you should just have faith that when the experts say it's your idea, of course it's your idea. Trust them. Oh, and especially trust them if we're using blockchain technology to verify, you know, transactions because, you know, the blockchain doesn't lie. <laughs> yes. Well, that so that reminded me, I thought about that when you mentioned consensus. Yeah. And so you've got these two options with blockchain. It's kind of like the internet where you have this potential for having a decentralized system where every single person has agency and they could do whatever they want and it's not under the control of a corporation or a government or any single entity. Um, the ideology is much more uh, libertarian, freedom-oriented, anarchist even. Um, so that, that would be kind of like the original ideal of blockchain technology, Bitcoin, or even the internet when it came out. Mm -hmm. um, even though military technology, you know, the yeah. origins at least, but, yeah. but still that was kind of, that was the promise when the internet came out and, and it still exists where I have access to so much information that even if I can't get a good, solid liberal arts education and read all the great books in a university, I can access every single one of them because I have the internet. And right. so like on one hand, that that's, that's wonderful. That's really good. Um, but on the other hand, um, you have consensus being used, especially in blockchain. That's how you determine when blocks are, are made and verifying that they are true and accurate and all these things. It's a matter of consensus. And yeah. um, it's taking all the stakeholders involved, all the miners and the different players in the blockchain technology. They come together, form a consensus, and that's <laughs> what gives it validity. Um, yeah. And so, again, like, there's, there's one way where that can technically be a good thing. But on the other hand, when you have a government, a corporation, a nonprofit being the ones that are generating all of the data, forming the consensus themselves, and then telling you what it is, um, all of these yeah. types of things, that gets a little different. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think if we go back to looking at human beings as existing in the in-between, you know, I think that there is a lot of wisdom to be gained from considering that image as sort of a model for other things. And, you know, I think we can look at blockchain and, you know, I, I don't, I don't pretend to understand the ins and outs of all of it, you know, like, like, how, I mean, I think I have a pretty good general idea, but, you know, I know that there, there are techni technicalities that are beyond me. Um, but it looks like that is absolutely where we're headed. And, I mean, I'd like to fight it and throw it off. But, um, you know, I think there are going to be some good things about it and there are going to be some bad things about it. Right now, it looks like there are going to be more bad things to me anyway, hmm. uh, because we're going to be setting up like permanent ledgers of people's lives and there's going to be no privacy. and You better be darn happy about it or else your social credit score is going to dip. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I think we, if we need to be, cautious uh, about people who, or about, maybe not about the people, but about the attitude that 
blockchain is going to save us, you know, or a distributed ledger is going to save us, or that consensus is going to save us. Because there are no easy fixes to human problems. And so, you know, and that's why is that? It's because we live in the mid-taxi. Like we're all, we're oriented toward order, like our souls, our minds, uh, you know, our reason as a faculty that it craves order. It's drawn toward it. It is illuminated by order. You know, it's like the metaphor of the sun where it nourishes and um, preserves. It generates, nourishes, and and preserves being. Uh, so I think if we if we look at at our creations, <laughs> say blockchain, as as something that holds out potential, but it also has the danger of slipping into, you know, a, a very negative situation. Like it it threatens, you know, things that are crucial to you know, right order in the soul, if, if we hesitate when we find accounts that hold out one of our creations as the, the savior, the be all end all of, of humanity's problems, then I think we'll be, we'll be on our way toward some kind of a recovery. Now it's never going to be a final or permanent recovery, but if we can, you know, somehow learn to be to identify these keys, these magical keys that are going to fix all our problems. And and if we can be sort of hesitant or, you know, exercise a healthy skepticism toward leaders or officials or, you know, social influencers who claim to have like the answer then I think we'll be closer to that process of, you know, turning around toward what's real and away from what is false, you know? I think, when, and then once we have, you know, turned ourselves um, a little bit more in the direction of truth, then I think we'll actually be better at using things like blockchain or um you know, some medical technologies that can help people. But whenever we see something held out as the fix, whether it's a vaccine, whether it is blockchain, whether it is, you know, a specific curriculum or, I don't know, a diet or whatever, I think we should always, you know, just be hesitant. Like anything that makes that claim, it, that, Go, it's, it flies in the face of our experience of the limited and imperfect situation of, of, of human existence. Yeah. I don't know. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't know. I haven't yeah. really, yeah. I haven't really theorized that for myself, you know, it's, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, my, my personal opinion, at least on, um, especially specifically on blockchain is that a truly, what probably you and I would consider beneficial application of a blockchain technology or cryptocurrency or whatever would be one that is private, yeah. that is totally voluntary on all accounts, yeah. and that is truly decentralized, not in the buzzword occulted meaning of decentralized that they're using yeah. now, but but truly there is no centralized source that has massive amounts of influence on it. And yes, there are some projects out there that fit that bill. But yeah. I totally agree with you that the the future of how technology is going and how the technocratic control grid is going to be ran, <laughs> they're going to call that blockchain. They're yeah. going to have these digital cryptocurrencies that all the governments are going to release. <laughs> and, and yeah, it's it's just it's yeah, it's a designed version of kind of more of a pure ideology in a sense. And that's wrong. Yeah. Yes, like the and original ideology us. sought the yeah. natural. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like philosophy seeks the natural. It seeks like what's real, like what has more reality than things that we have made. And you know, all of these all of these solutions, whether it's, 
you know, it could be social, I mean, social impact finance. What is it? It's you you see all of these investors celebrating. Oh, guess what? We messed up. It, we, you know, shareholder capitalism. We had good intentions. Klaus Schwab wrote this in a Time Magazine article. People had good intentions, but things just went a little awry. <laughs> and we've ended up with this massive inequality that is leading to terrible gaps in, you know, uh, the education and attainment levels and success prospects for vulnerable people and then the people who are advantaged, whatever, blah, blah. You know, he says this, th- th- this was a, it was just a little mistake, but now we have this wonderful fix, social impact finance or ESG, environmental, social and governance investing. So we're going to be socially responsible because now we have figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they, the slogan, we're going to do well by doing good. Oh, here we have this perfect way to get to be capitalist but get over the problems created by capitalism and that's what they hold it out uh, yes this is a you know you have let's say we have this tension or a dichotomy between like capitalism and communism i mean you know they're both you know more similar than people want to admit i think and they both sort of trend in the same direction. I mean, they have different flavors, right? But um, but those two alternatives are sort of set up as these as these extremes, and you have to pick one or the other. Um, but both have historically caused a lot of problems, and so people are looking for a way out of that um, that dialectic. Uh, and ta-da, you have social impact finance, which cares for the public while also generating a, a financial return for investors. And, oh, it's sustainable. So if we keep giving, if we give a little financial return on these philanthropic investments and we, you know, join philanthropy with the deep pockets of government, then, oh, look, <laughs> we have sustainable <laughs> economic like hmm. transformation. We can really, I mean, you look at the World Economic Forum and they say this, we can really begin to tackle some of these urgent and pressing problems like pro- poverty and uh, the degradation of the planet. Well, th- that's all magic, like you say. It's, I mean, you're wor- like, it's such a good word. It is magic. They're, they're casting a spell because we're never going to solve all of those problems. We're never going to, you know, finally arrive at a point where we have a perfect economic system that generates consensus among everyone. No, we're, we're people and we're going to disagree. <laughs> and there's always going to be another stage. And so... You know, they say, well, yeah, we're going to we're going to keep tackling these problems till they're done. And that's the reason why we grant this return on investment. Um, And then we're going to finish these finish off poverty and and the rest. And life is going to be this magical utopia. Well, deep down inside, I think everyone knows that that is impossible and that, that human life is fraught with suffering. So. If you measure, if you trust your gut is what I always like to say, trust, like trust your gut, trust your own experience on some of these things. Not, I mean, we always want to be testing, but we don't want to just deny our intuitions and, and our experiences. So if we know that life is flawed and that despite our best efforts, like we can't make everything perfect. We should, we should rely on that as a source of, of important information to counteract this narrative of blissful utopia that is, 
you know, being set up by both the transhumanists and their singularity and then the social impact financiers and their like nice globalized agenda 21 world, <laughs> yeah. you know, you, you know, you, ex- I think you expect more from people, you know, you, we need to have like high expectations of people and we need to sort of give people the benefit of the doubt and, and trust that they can use their own agency. And we also need to be cautious about as like ascribing too much to people. Like we have to know we're, we're always in the in-between. We are capable of, of great good and we're capable of great evil. And, you know, perhaps the, the, best thing we can do is to try to steer toward a little bit better than the middle, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so to kind of wrap things up is my goal at least here. Um, (laughs) So you have this aspect of a designed reality and kind of in my head, I've broken this down into pretty much all of the main aspects of society. You have physical design. And I've Mm -hmm. heard you mention about playgrounds with weight limits on things or uh, play tables for little kids where there's cameras and they're monitoring how they play together and gathering that data or um, vehicles. When vehicles first came out, as soon as they became very popular, then as cities were designed and urban planning came into play, it got to a point where every city was designed with vehicles in mind. And so if you didn't have a vehicle, then all of a sudden you couldn't operate in that city the way it was designed to be operated in. And so that designed physical realm basically controlled people's behaviors. And yes. um, the same thing with, with economic design. You mentioned uh, sustainable economic development. Um, it, it's all about who who interacts together, who produces, who buys, who sells, and what are the rules that they have to go by. And that's all designed. And you mentioned like a like a, a communism versus capitalism, and uh, both are deemed as evil by different people. But uh, we end up with something in the middle where you have a mix of the corporate world and the world of the state. And by definition, when you mix those two, that's corporatism. That's fascism. Yeah. yeah. Um, most people wouldn't be on board if you named it by its true name. But yeah. but you're right. Everybody loves the idea of a public private partnership. That sounds great. And yeah. it's not. And it's, it's all not. it's all designed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, like when you get into all of this stuff and see how you have this design, um, even in even in culture, like um you have uh propaganda, education, you've got the media, or as Plato would say, music, um, mm-hmm. all of these influences on people. Um, You can even look at, you've mentioned uh, philanthropic organizations and people. Uh, I've focused a lot in the past few years ago, did a lot on the Rockefeller Institution. And um, the Rockefeller Foundation really, uh, them and probably the Carnegie Endowment probably had the biggest impact on education in the early Mm -hmm. 1900s. Um, And there's a lot of similarities with um, with current times and then. But uh, another really interesting aspect that kind of ties into a few of these things is that um, the Rockefeller Foundation and the London School of Economics, which has its own kind of dark connections, um, mm-hmm. they both played a critical role in bringing Frederick Hayek to America. Um, and he was someone that was all about free markets. That's most yeah. libertarians kind of base their ideology with Mises and Hayek and ideally get into Rothbard and maybe Konkin. Um, But Hayek really kind of has some connections. It's like, you know, he tutored one of the Rockefellers, was brought over with their money. (laughs) It's like, why would they do that? Well, if you're trying to get people on board with this idea of free markets and you are setting it up so that they're not truly free and you're actually going to manipulate them, um, but people are going to be on board with it. Like there's all these different aspects of, of designing reality. You're meshing yeah. the virtual with the physical. <laughs> you're altering nature. You're controlling science and truth and just everything. It's all it's all gamified. It's all data-based. And it's all about yeah, making the right numbers. And someone else, of course, determines what numbers are the right numbers, like you say. Um, yeah. But 
but like with all of this, so we recognize all of this. We see this. It is currently playing out. We also see that there's some sort of designed revolution in a sense. At some point, there's this shift. There is this great reset. There is this uh, technocracy that's going to take the place of our current order of things. It's uh, stakeholder capitalism instead of shareholder capitalism. <laughs> uh-huh. um, yeah, so this is also designed, and that doesn't lead anywhere good. I think we, we recognize <laughs> that. Uh-huh. Um, but to to actually wrap it up, um, I, I would like to have some sort of s- hopeful solutions-based commentary at the end. Um, <laughs> and you mentioned the idea of of sharing this information with people and getting the word out there. And it kind of reminded me of, we've used kind of a, um, uh, the example of Christianity a few times, and it's this idea of go and disciple people. It's not, it's not yeah. just like get them to believe that God exists. It's not, you know, go start a church. It's go to individuals and help them on their path to a better life, so to say. Um, yeah. Is that kind of more what what you're getting out and and your idea of kind of a solution to the, all this design that has all these nefarious intentions? Yeah, I guess it is because you know if you're des- you know if we look at the attitudes of the controllers, they're they believe that you know, the people for whom they're designing these things, they believe that they need to be controlled. You know, some, I mean, they either believe in like, you know, a lower class that needs to be controlled for the benefit of the upper class, or they believe in like a lower class that needs to be controlled for the benefit of of itself, you know, and so people persuade themselves that by controlling these lower classes, they're actually helping the lower classes. Um, but they, but there is, there's an assumption there that they're, you know, at least two different categories uh, or essences of human beings, and that one class needs to. Uh, or should, or has the moral license to dictate to the other, and I think that's that's really what we've got to get over. And it's it sounds sort of I don't know hippieish or so, <laughs> or something hmm. until you think about I think until you put it in the context of of you know this paradigm of education as conversion. And, you know, we we each have a, a set of our own talents and capacities, and we have a, a sort of way or, I don't know, a path of individual flourishing. And sometimes that's going to coincide with the public good, the common good, and sometimes it's going to diverge from it. But but I think that if we can look at, at what we have to, to give, um, I mean, this sounds communitarian, but, <laughs> hmm. but I think, like, if we can preserve this sense of the importance of an individual life, and the uniqueness of a question that animates every single individual life. And if we can if we can really take the project of being an authentic person as real and as a guiding paradigm, you know, and for me, I mean, you know, I I am a Christian and I believe that, you know, I take my bearings from you know, both philosophy and my academic studies, but then also from my faith. Um, so if we can, if we can look at our individual self and know that we have this obligation to live well, um, and we try to direct that toward, you know, a 
a response to or some kind of relationship with other human beings, whether individually or in community, um, if we can direct it toward their flourishing through the example of like when Christ says you should love your neighbor. And, you know, my husband and I were talking last night and he, Tony said, oh, yeah, well, you know, he says love your neighbor, not love your community. And I was like, oh, that's that is so important. Right. You're supposed mm. to move sort of one on one. But but, you know, if I can retain the sense of urgency and importance of my individual life and my individual um, pursuit of the truth at the same time that I can see, I can recognize that every other person has that same obligation and that same capacity and, and that same privilege of sort of pursuing their own life question and, and life path, then if I can hold those together and kind of offer what I have to others, I think that that might be, I mean, it sounds sort of abstract, but I think that that could be an alternative to the system of domination and control. And so, you know, I, I am not naive or so inconsistent that I would say that that's going to solve all of our problems. It's not going to because we're human beings and we're flawed and we're going to make mistakes and we're going to have bad intentions. And sometimes we're, you know, our, maybe our environment is preventing us from seeing something or, or whatever. Um, so I don't offer it as a, as a final or permanent solution, but I think if we can, you know, meet other other people as individuals where they are and respect their capacity to make a, make a good decision, um, for their life, then, and we see some way that maybe we could help them make a good decision, not by giving them an answer, but by just informing their, a catalog of materials upon which they draw and in, in their own um, wrestling with whatever problem it is. I think that is, that's how we have to fight this thing, sort of. I know that sounds like abstract, and in other places I've said, well, I think we need to pull out of the education system, like we need to bankrupt higher ed, we need to sort of pick on your local officials and like Mm -hmm. shame them, you know, so those are more concrete things that people like, but on a spiritual level, yeah, it's sort of, it is, it's this discipleship. It is, you know, giving from, you know, without expecting in return, it's giving without uh, demanding any kind of um, recognition of your rightness or superiority from another it's like you know you just offer it and I don't know how you can I don't know how we can get there on any kind of large scale effort but I'm hoping that through some kind of a miracle and you know that longing that every human being has to be to have order in the soul I'm hoping that if more and more of us show by our example that we're willing to put ourselves out there and be blackballed from the professional world, or we're not, you know, we're not afraid to have our social credit score fall. Like we're, we're going to put ourselves out there and try to just do life affirming things. Then I think maybe, maybe that will attract some people you know, and I don't know. It's, yeah. I hope that that's hopeful enough. I don't. I don't yeah. want to. I don't want to give it as like I say, because we're in the mid taxi. Like, it's not gonna. It's not gonna save everybody, but there are some people close to us, and if we can do our best to, you know, save them from some of this like tyrannical uh, brainwashing and and occlusion of the truth, then, I mean, I think that's a, that's a life well lived right there. Yeah, definitely. I, I really like that. I like the idea of 
of individualism, I guess, but but individualism based on service, not based on the self, um, because I think that's more the other route is I am an individual and it's all about me. Um, yeah. But it's it's also focused on other individuals, um, yeah. your neighbor, and not the community or the social body as a whole. <laughs> Um, yeah. And I, I really like that distinction. I think that's really good. Um, Isn't that, you it, know, because it's concrete, it's real, you know? Yeah. I mean, what, when we say, oh, yeah, well, the community, like, what the hell are we talking about? <laughs> Nobody yeah, knows. Everyone's yeah. going to define it differently. But if I say, oh, here's my neighbor who has a name, who is, you know, is a specific person, with, you know, that has his or her own set of experiences and catalog of, of tools or helps, you know, in trying to navigate this thing called life. Like I, you know, I can talk about how I should, you know, treat that person or relate to that person or have a relationship with that person. And, and it's going to make sense. And you can, you know, people both participants in the relationship and other observers, they can see, is this a good, healthy relationship? Is it not? And they can, you know, you can test it because it's two concrete people versus, you know, oh, me and the society, me and the community or the community and I like there, there's no way to test that because we don't even know who the community is, what it is, what it stands for. It's too abstract. And we, we are concrete beings. And like you said, this, you know, we have had a long process of, of, you know, the climate of opinion really focusing on the material world, like to the detriment of the spiritual world and the psychic world or the world of the psyche. Um, and that really was preparing for this, uh, this flip into a, a disembodied virtual spiritual existence and you can't do one or the other you we're both we're mixed and so we want to keep things concrete and we can still we can still mess around and fumble through this world and and we can allow freedom and it's going to entail mistakes it's going to allow for that possibility but i think it's a lot better than you know, living in a Skinner box designed by, you know, the the coolest um, architectural design firm on the block, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we see that most of the movement agenda, whatever the shift is that's occurring, it, a lot of it has to do with dehumanizing people. And yeah. so it's, um, it, it's like the, um, the abortion debate. It's, it's, it's not a human being. You know, it's something scientific, something abstract, or you get into the technocratic aspects where um, a person is data or yeah. in academia, a person is their credentials yeah. or in the general world, you identify people by the sports teams that they associate with or the brands that they like or the job that they have. None of those actually get to who that individual truly is. And unfortunately, right. I think a lot of people don't even know who they are as individuals because yeah. they themselves have manifested these identities. Yeah. Um, but I think people are seeing that, I am hoping, and they are going the opposite direction and want to humanize people and go this route that you're talking about. And I really like that um, that analogy of us being in between the material and the spiritual. They're there are a few other people that that I follow and I really like that talk about kind of the role of humanity is to be the intermediary between the spiritual and the physical or and nature. And basically to give nature meaning is part of our role as human beings, because yeah. without consciousness and, you know, that aspect of logos, without having a people here, or you could say divinity, but that's not us. So um, <laughs> for our role, um, we, 
we are needed in order for the natural world to have any sort of meaning. Otherwise, it's just uh, systematic and it's X causes Y causes Z. And th that's all it is. There's no true meaning. There's no higher meaning. There's no higher purpose. And we as human beings, that's part of our role is to connect this kind of dead world in a sense with a higher meaning with that spiritual realm. And we are that in-between role. And I, I think that that also is in direct contrast to, uh, let's say, this utopia of uploading our consciousness to this <laughs> infinite reality that we can totally design and control. Well, in that reality, there necessarily cannot be meaning because everything is done with the knowledge that it is not real. And everything is done in a way that has been developed by somebody else. It's controlled by something else. It's There are no consequences in a fake virtual world. And so it just necessarily, you lose meaning. You could live forever. I bet you would lose meaning pretty quickly in that life though. Yeah. And so, yeah, seeking something where you're seeking meaning and um, other people and serving others and getting to know others and building relationships, that aspect of true, what I would say is true community. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think that I think there is definitely hope there. And that is a, a very positive message. Well, good. I, I hope that it would be, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes. and and, you know, we still we test, you know, we still want to you know, we always want to be improving because we know that there is some objective standard. So just like you said, I mean, if we're giving, if the sort of unique privilege of human beings is to give some meaning or to manifest some meaning of nature and the natural world, well, you know, aren't we couldn't do that without the the fixed content, you know, for our reflection to work on. And so we can, we can think about this process of giving meaning and reflecting it on it. And it doesn't have to be one of domination. Like it really can be a sort of, you know, a, a kind of mutual, it can be a process that generates this mutual respect. Like I want to take care of the world, I see its goodness. I see that it's necessary for me and for my highest functions. And, you know, there's a beauty there and a logic there and, and an order that, that helps me move on myself because I can actually engage something. And so I think that that we can, we can really focus on how that two participants in a relationship that do different things, you know, that kind of relationship doesn't have to be one of domination. It's sort of like, you know, males and females. I mean, I think we have different strengths and capacities and, and they're complementary. No. We're all the <laughs> yeah. same. Come on. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, <laughs> um, you know, I, so we've got to, we've got to, I think, accept the messiness and see the potential of it. And there is, there's a lot of, I don't know, I, I'm hoping that we're going to really rediscover a lot of, of joy. And that's, I, you know, that's become a buzzword lately. So I sort of hesitate to use it, but <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of joy in like these very human things. And it's sad that we have to be confronted with the unlimited abyss of virtual experiences to make us appreciate that concrete and, you know, limited world of, of the human condition. But, but I am hopeful that the the free floating, untethered, like wide open possibility of living in in a world without a touchstone, without a nature that's stable to reflect on. I mean, I I think that that's gonna. I, I hope it will throw us back into ourselves, and we'll be able to see that 
hey, you know, this messy life, like part of part of what makes it beautiful is this messiness. So anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, so if you would, I would like for you to direct listeners to more of your content. If there is any particular place that they should seek you or follow you or other interviews that you would particularly recommend. Um, I would also like for you to mention the names of the two main philosophers you mentioned earlier as well. So I can write that down and put that in the show notes. Sure. Okay. So uh, you can find some, you can find more interviews with me uh, at my website, which is very much a work in progress. I, I want to get to the point where I'm updating it with longer posts. Um, but I'm not there yet. But anyway, it is www.heartsoverhexagons.com. And that's hearts like the shape um, over hexagons like the shape.com. So that's where you can find me or on Facebook. And I use Facebook quite a lot. Um, it, it is a pretty effective platform for disseminating information. And my profile is just Julianne Romanello. And I have a shirt on that you'll recognize if there are several Julianne Romanellos. And I have a, it's black and it says resist the new world order. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and my, my profile is public. So I think that you don't even have to be a member of Facebook to see my posts. But um, yeah, I write a lot of stuff there and I have a, a, bunch of wonderful people who add comments. I mean, I, I have met some really intelligent and thoughtful people. And so if, if you happen to follow my page, you get that added bonus of, of all those folks. Uh, the two names that I mentioned are uh, Eric Vogelin, and you spell his last name V-O-E. G E L I N, Eric Vogelin. Yeah. And I wrote an article, a scholarly article, not a fighting techno fascism article, on Vogelin. Mm-hmm. And it's called On Classical Studies. And it deals with his essay of the same title. And it's a pretty good overview to his thought if you want that. Or you could just check out the primary sources, which is the best thing to do. Yes. Um, then the, our Communi- godfather guru of communitarianism is Amitai Etzioni, and I'll spell that. His first name is spelled A-M-I-T-A-I. His last name is spelled E-T-Z-I-O-N-I, and he has written many books. He's uh, consulted with many presidents and government officials, and um, I don't think he's a very good guy, but you should read his read his stuff and judge for yourself. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm I'm all about source documents. I am all about going to the people themselves instead of reviews of and commentary on the people. And so I I also totally agree with reading people that you totally disagree with, and yeah. uh, that I have probably learned more from those types of people than I have from people that are espousing the views I already have. <laughs> oh yeah, I totally agree. I'm the same way. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming on. I, I really appreciate it. I think this has hit on a lot of stuff I didn't expect us to hit on um, in a good <laughs> way. And so I, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And um, I hope that your endeavors in trying to disseminate all of this information is prosperous. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks so much for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure and um, we'll be in touch for sure. So that concludes the interview with Julianne Romanello. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I thought that this interview really paired well with everything from Vin Armani and also Michael Vlahos, and also it ties in well with the next guest, Allison McDowell, who many of you are probably familiar with. And so I think this has been a 
a very good setup for season three and uh, kind of rounding out this idea of historical cycles and patterns and the shifts that we are going through in today's society and technocracy and a lot of these topics that I have been discussing, I guess, all the way since season one, really, but uh, especially in more recent times. So with that being said, I want to give the announcement, like I just said, that Allison McDowell is going to be the next guest on the show. I am really looking forward to that, at least as of right now, as I am recording this intro and outro. I have not done that interview with her yet. I am doing that very soon. And so I am really looking forward to that. It's kind of probably going to be a bit of a last minute thing as far as releasing it probably a few days after we record it. Usually I've got a week or two or more um, to work on that and edit it and stuff. But It should work out very well. I think Allison McDowell is a very good pair with especially Julianne Romanello. They, I believe they are associates of some kind, know each other, have talked, something like that. But they have some similar views on a lot of things. But Allison McDowell definitely approaches it from a different perspective and gets into a lot of stuff that we haven't really covered much in this show, but is extremely relevant to this conversation, especially talking about how the technocracy is implemented and how technology is used in that. And if you think back, if you have actually listened to the podcast as a whole like you are supposed to. By the way, if you have not, this podcast is intended to be listened to and in its entirety. So if you have not done so, ideally, you start at episode one. You probably have to go to the podcast website to do that. The link's in the show notes um, because many podcast players start off later on in the podcast and don't have every single episode on there. But anyway, if you go back to season one, listen all the way through, About three quarters of the way through season one, I did a whole series on blockchain technology. So if that is something you are not very familiar with, definitely go back and listen to that series. Highly, highly, highly recommend that. If you are aware of what blockchain technology is, maybe what Bitcoin is and a few of the altcoins, but you just don't have a very good grasp on that or have very much depth in that area, I still would highly recommend listening to that series if you haven't done so already. Or if you haven't listened to it since I released it way back in season one, and you personally don't have a lot of interaction with those concepts and that technology, it might be good to review because at least I am assuming and I am 99% sure Allison McDowell and I will be discussing blockchain technology quite a bit. She is not necessarily a very big fan of that. And I think that she has a very good perspective on that. You will notice if you do listen to that series that I did, I think it starts at episode 41, if I remember right, to give you a bit of a marker there. But I did have some periods where I discussed the negatives of blockchain technology, some of the dangers of that technology and of that movement and the difference between the ideological beginnings of that versus how it would likely be carried out in the future. And I believe, I haven't gone back and listened to that actually myself, but if I remember right, a lot of the stuff I talked about are things that Allison McDowell will be going into depth on. And much of what I discussed in those episodes has panned out fairly well now that we're a few years in the future from that. Uh, For example, if you had bought some of the cryptocurrencies that were mentioned in that series, you would probably be doing very well right now. So I do recommend that. Hopefully, you will enjoy the Allison McDowell interview as much as you have enjoyed Vin and Julianne and Michael Vlahos. And that is what is coming up next. I do want to say thank you very much for everyone that is still a supporter on Patreon and Subscribestar. I did release the interview after Allison McDowell, the one that we'll release after her. That is a second Vin Armani interview. Um, I released that in its entirety on Subscribestar first, and then I released it a few weeks later on Patreon. I just did that the other day. So that is there. If you are a supporter, then you can check that out and get early access to that. I had also released 
all three parts of the Julianne Romanello interview on those sites before I release them all on the main feed. So that's just a perk that you can get. I'll do the same with the Allison McDowell interview. I'll release the whole thing on those sites. So if you want to listen to them in in their entirety at your leisure, you can do so. If you do want to subscribe just to get access to that second Ven Armani interview or to any interview that I do. You just want to hear all the parts at once and you're willing to pay $4, I think is the tier for that. Then you are more than welcome to sign up and then just cancel your support after a month. I do not mind at all. There are multiple people that did that for the first Ven Armani interview. And unfortunately for them, they canceled their subscription before I released the second interview, which they are probably interested in. So Oh, well, you can sign up again and cancel again if you're interested. There have been two or three people that have dropped back off. But luckily, uh, most of the people that signed on, most of you listeners who signed on to support this show and the things that I'm doing here have stayed. And so I really, really, really appreciate that. That is something that is a really big deal. And thank you very much to you guys and girls out there who are doing so. I did get to ask some of the questions that you guys had submitted to me with the Vin Armani interview in particular. And so when I get into that second interview, some of those questions are addressed there. And I think that you will really enjoy putting Allison McDowell in between Julianne Romanello and Vin Armani. This is going to be a very good pairing here. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm kind of jealous of the listeners who get to listen to this the way that um, I am able to lay that out and schedule that. For a final note, I had done an interview with a different podcast, the Bad Roman podcast, and that was done a while ago, but they just released that a few days ago. So if it is something you are interested interested in listening to me going on someone else's show and discussing agorism, specifically Christian agorism. It is a podcast that discusses a kind of a Christian slash anarchist perspective on things. And they've had some really good guests. I've listened to that show before in the past and really liked it. And so uh, thank you. If anybody from that show is listening to this, thank you for having me on. And I definitely enjoyed going on there. So if that's something that you are interested in, then you can seek that out. There is a section on the podcast website on ourfoundations.podbean.com where I have, if you look at the drop-down menu at the top left, there's a section that says Appearances, and I have all those listed. I don't think the Bad Roman one is actually (laughs) listed as I am saying this right now, but I will make sure that it gets out there in the next few days so that you can get a good link to that. But you can always just search The Bad Roman Podcast. I'm sure that's not too hard to figure out for you. So other than that, though, if you are ever interested in other appearances I've done, other interviews I've done, as well as if you are really interested in some guests that I have had on this show, then I do have links for all that and that all listed under appearances. So that is something you might be interested. Also, there's a tab for resources if you're interested in books or podcasts or things like that that I use for resources then you might want to check that out and see if there are any resources that you would like to check out yourself. With that, I think I am done here. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for all of your support. Please leave a rating or review if you have not done so already. I am out. Peace. This has been another episode of Our Foundation Podcast. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you. Goodbye.